always think of it as a living ecosystem, and or, almost like an organism, something that ultimately really um, is what makes California, California. That's my argument in my book. And, um, and it, so the book is really based on the last 20 years of my work to help save that coastline, but also really not at the highest levels, at the lowest levels. At, at working fisherman to fisherman, surfer to surfer, community to community, and really mobilizing people to really defend their coast and ocean and these ecosystems that they depend on. So I did a little, little slideshow and talked to you about sort of my experiences and some of the things that, um, that I've seen on the coast. And so uh, there'll be a lot of pretty images. I promise not to bum you out. So I, I, I'm one of those environmentalists and conservationists that believes that actually we look on the good side of things and give people hope because if we don't, then the sky is continually falling and we just get sit paralyzed in a ball. So uh, anyway, um, so I'm the executive director of Wild Coast, um, Coastal Salvaje. We're a binational organization that conserves coastal and marine ecosystems and wildlife. I started in 2000 after starting the Nature Conservancy's Baja program and living um, really about three years in Baja to do my uh, PhD work on gray whale conservation. Where my wife and I lived in a 14-foot trailer with our dog Chip, but off the grid, completely off the grid in the middle of nowhere. And that was the basis for my first book, Saving the Gray Whale. But Wild Coast, Coastal Salvaje, we're based in Imperial Beach on the border uh, in Ensenada, and then we have a field office actually in Cabo, uh, and then in, in, um, in, in Acapulco, and really we do two things, and that's focus on saving the last wild coastlines of the Californias, huge giant areas. Uh, right now we're negotiating deals to save about 15 miles of coastline, um, and we'll buy the coastline. Um, number two, to stop the slaughter of endangered animals like sea turtles, and today we're on uh, Mexico's national televisa network. We had, out, we had an archbishop of, of Acapulco ask people not say that it was a sin for people to eat sea turtles during Lent, and that went national. And we're hoping that all the bishops in Mexico actually uh, make, make that message. So, uh, and then finally, the third thing we do on the border here in Southern California is we actually try to save these river valleys and wetlands and, and coast, coastal areas that really still remain. And Ben McHugh right here in the blue sweater is my conservation director. And he's actually in the book, so it's really cool that he's here tonight. Um, but, you know, wild coast, wild sea, and, and really when, when we think of a coastline, you know, if, and in San Diego, for me, La Jolla is the most beautiful part of our coastline. It's something, it's a living ecosystem. You go out in the water and swim with seals and body surf beautiful waves and see fish. Um, and, you know, as you can see whales off the coast. But really, we've forgotten what a real coastline is. And think of Torrey Pines. This is, this is uh, what's called the Seven Sisters in, in the Central Pacific, Baja, California. But it's like this for 100 miles, 130 miles, actually, 140 miles. Um, and we've actually, for this area, we've bought up every uh, watershed and wetland for about 100 miles. And the idea is to make sure there's one last area that is actually a wild coastline. And we're doing that in partnership with the National Park Service and local people. Um, but again, wild sea and wild coast, it's the Sea of Cortez. And this is in Loreto. Um, it's considered the Galapagos of Mexico. There's lots of islands. Every, a lot of the islands have endemic species. Um, and this is... There's no other place in the world where you see more cetaceans, whales and dolphins, than in the Sea of Cortez. That's why uh, Jacques Cousteau called it the world's aquarium. So you're know, really, really lucky to have this in our backyard. Um, some of the folks now are talking about a guy named Garth Murphy, who's a legendary San Diego surfer, environmental activist, conservationist. And um, he and I had done an interview for Surfline.com, a very popular surfing website. And we really talked about surf sites as ecosystems. And that's something that a lot of surfers don't think about. A lot of surfers, especially in La Jolla, are obsessed with localism, keeping everybody out of the break instead of stewardship, which is taking care of the break. And I'm always struck by the fact that every time I go out in the water at Winnessee and see some nutcase screaming at somebody, he, he's screaming at some 14-year-old kid who's, he thinks he's interfering with his way, but he's doing nothing about the, the sewage pipe that's draining into the water right there. And I think that's sometimes the, and whereas there are a lot of uh, forward-thinking surfers that really have thought about this idea of, of stewardship um, and really the idea that we need to take care of these ecosystems that infuse, not that make these waves perfect and give us a great ride, but also create this amazing marine and coastal environment that really sustains the Pacific Ocean. Um, and just my background, you know, my parents were immigrants. That's my mom on the left, my crazy uncle Emil from Switzerland, and my little brother Nikki, and this is me. And that's in San Felipe in 1972-73. And my parents were war refugees from Europe, and so, you know, when my dad came to this country, and my, they came, finally came to, my parents moved from New York to L.A. Um, they moved after the Second World War, they were here, and then they moved to L.A. in the early 60s, where I was born. And my dad said, you know, every day I went to the beach in Malibu or, or you know, uh, Santa Monica, we felt like Hollywood movie stars because you didn't have to be rich to go to the beach. And that's what's great about th this, this living democracy we have in Southern California is everyone goes to the beach. The beach is 
our public access resource where we really spend our lives. And that for me, at least, I grew up on the beach in Santa Monica, Malibu. My English mother would put me in the sun naked. We didn't worry about sunscreen back then to get me uh, tan year round. And um, in 1973, or I think it was 72 or 73, we discovered San Felipe and we discovered Mexico. And that was, for my family at least, the sort of hippie beach family, that was it. We started going south from then on. And uh, in 1974, my dad loaded up our this Ford Econoline van and uh, we drove to El Salvador. And we visited every be every little community, beach community, mountain community in Mexico, places that nobody would ever think about going to now. I mean, like we were in Chiapas, in the highlands with Indians. We were in, uh, in the Sea of Cortez. We are in the highlands of Oaxaca, uh, Quintana Roo, in the middle of nowhere. I mean, it was just amazing. And then we lived, we were in El Salvador for a year where my dad was working. Uh, this is pre-revolution El Salvador. And uh, also traveling around Guatemala, just crazy stuff, you know, living in our van uh, with our big giant husky uh, shadow, and which was a really good thing to do. It was during Nixon's war, on, uh, the first iteration of the war on drugs. There were lots of trigger-happy soldiers in Mexico that searching our hippie van, right, for, for drugs. Um, so it was a very interesting time to be there. But one of the things that I learned from that experience, and it really hit me to see the shocking poverty that we saw in El Salvador and in Mexico and Guatemala, was the fact that you cannot, when we do this conservation work in developing world like I do, you can't ignore issues of poverty. You can't is ignore issues of underdevelopment. You can't ignore people's everyday lives. And more importantly, everybody, every, people's everyday lives, like this man, in this mangrove lagoon in El Salvador, and that's me at the back with my little brother and our Spanish hippie friends, uh, their kids. Um, is that, you know, issues of conservation are directly related to issues of social justice and environmental justice. And for me and my colleagues at Wild Coast, a lot of us who work in conservation in the developing world, that is f something that we f first and foremost think of every time we do something is we have to make sure this won't adversely Im impact someone's livelihood. Because the fact is that we're saving these areas because we're interested in saving mangroves and carbon sequestration and the amazing fish spawning sites that exist in these mangroves, but there are other people there, the people who live there, that actually depend on harvesting fish for their livelihoods. And you really have to work with them to get conservation done, because what we've learned in the developing world, and as well we've learned in California and other places, that you can't do conservation unless you involve people who live around these resources. Um, but at the age of um, 15, uh, when, I, when I started surfing at the age of 13 and 77, and so my dad, we had a 64 six volt van, and my dad, I convinced my dad and my, with my friend Tim Hannon here on the left with a little cow to sort of take us uh, during Christmas break. And we discovered this wonderful coastline of central Baja California where I surfed with dolphins. I uh, met these friendly fishermen who would drop off lobster for free. Mm -hmm. uh, literally gray whales were breaching off the coast. And I realized that this is a place I, I really wanted to spend a lot of time at. And we're still, Wild Coast is still working literally just up the coast from these areas. Um, but I grew up around the Tijuana Estuary and Imperial Beach, and my parents moved from L.A. to uh, Imperial Beach in 1971. And um, we literally lived next to the Tijuana Estuary, which then, in that, in, that, in that time, was an open access area. It wasn't a wildlife refuge, but it was slated to be the next Marina del Rey. Um, Brian Bilbray, our mayor here, is now, uh, unfortunately, not your congressman. He's North County's congressman. But um, I grew up in Imperial Beach with him. His goal for Imperial Beach was to tear down a lot of the houses along the coast and put a marina and high-rise condos in the Tijuana Estuary. Um, at one point for the Tijuana Estuary there was slated to be a nuclear power plant, a, a large concrete channel, um, this high-rise condos, and then basically this marina. That would have included a mile-long uh, jetties at the mouth of the Tijuana River, which we now know would have been a giant mistake since 15 to 25 foot waves break out there on giant north swells. The waves just keep breaking and never end, end up breaking. So putting a marina there probably would have been impossible. But in 1980, as part of this whole effort to, um, to develop the asteroid and, and destroy it, really, uh, they decided to dam up illegally. Brian Bilbray and his cohorts in the city council decided to dam up the, the river mouth. So my, me and my friend Benny Holt, who's still a cross-country coach in Imperial Beach and a lifeguard, and my buddy Jack Burns, uh, I was 16, Jack was 17, and Benny was probably in his 30s, um, decided to sit in front of the bulldozers. And uh, the bulldozers fought back, Brian dumped, and more lifeguards, Imperial Beach lifeguards, and, uh, actually, a lot of these guys were big wave surfers from the, at the, who surfed the Tijuana Sloughs. Uh, joined us, we got rocks dumped on us, garbage dumped on us. Um, and then I actually, this is me under here with my legs, uh, getting my head pounded in. And my buddy Dave Parra trying to save us. He's still, I still surf with him. But the fact is we won. 
All right, we mobilized the community. Um, back then, 80% of Imperial Beach was actually in favor of developing the marina. So we were a small minority fighting to save this amazing resource. But today, it's a national wildlife refuge. It's a national estuarine research reserve. It's actually the largest remaining coastal salt marsh left in Southern California that hasn't been bisected by a road, so it, a highway. So it's really, really an interesting place, an important place, home to clapper rails, these turns. And more importantly, um, it's a really, really uh, important place for the community and some, a, a resource that the entire region of South San Diego uh, enjoys. And then another important milestone for me in, in really understanding our coastline was interviewing a whole group of surfers, including Dempsey Holder and a lot of the, the pioneers of surfing in, uh, in La Jolla um, that had surfed the Tijuana Sloughs, this mythical big wave break at the, at the, at the outside of the Tijuana Estuary back starting from the 1930s to the 1950s. These guys were the pioneers of surfing in California. And this is Dempsey Holder, who's actually the, the kahuna, or the dean of the sloughs. He was a Wex, Texas immigrant, uh, Wex, Texas migrant that came during the Dust Bowl and learned how to surf in the 1930s, basically by himself, on a redwood board he had made himself. And um, I interviewed all these guys uh, in the summer of 1993, and what was really fascinating about that was not the fact that they, uh, guys like John Blankenship, who, who were here in La Jolla, and, and uh, wid I talked to the widow of, widow of Townie Cromwell, Townsend Cromwell, who was, uh, Mr. Cromwell was, uh, Dr. Cromwell was, a very famous oceanographer, uh, but they all surfed with Dempsey down at the sloughs. And what, what they all said was that it wasn't the great waves that they had scored. It was the fact, what was amazing to them was that they had nailed the coast of California when it was really, truly a wild coastline. When you could catch giant abalone and lobster off of places like La Jolla or Dana Point, that now no, Dana Point no longer exists, or Killer Dana, it's now a big marina. Um, you could catch giant black sea bass off the Coronado Pier. Was, um, and it, what, they are, what they talked about was how quickly that had eroded. So they nailed great waves, they scored great waves, La Jolla Cove when no one else surfed it. Um, they had all these great times at Wind and Sea, and you know, they were around Bob Simmons, who invented, really invented the modern surfboard at Wind and Sea and Imperial Beach. But again, it was that memory, uh, the visceral memory of these amazing resources that they had just basically in their lifetime had seen almost disappear. And, and, and really out of that, there's a concept called shifting baselines, which a really great oceanographer at Scripps, uh, Jeremy Jackson, another oceanographer named uh, Randy Olson, and then Chad Nelson, a surf writer, have really talked about. And that's this idea that we keep thinking that our baseline for understanding our natural environment is now, and we don't really ever understand that it's, we keep shifting our baseline. So having a degraded coastline seems normal. That's our baseline. Rather than understanding that 50 years ago, this coastline was a paradise. Um, we're talking about Garth Murphy, and Garth has a, uh, a, a book. What's it called again? The Indian Lover. The Indian Lover, and he really talks about that. I, I have a quote in my book, sorry, spacing. <laughs> this majestic California coastline. And it was so beautiful. It still is gorgeous, but imagine it 100 years ago when almost nothing was there. And I think that's something that's really important for us to move forward and, and, and conserve these ecosystems. We have to understand what, was, what we had in the past. And I think that's, that's really important. And in Baja, California, where I lived for three years and still work, my wife and I were in the field uh, for about three years, living completely off the grid with these isolated fishing communities. And so based on an experience I had in, in California, I really made an effort, we really made an effort to interview most of the oldest living residents on the Pacific coast of Baja, California. So this gentleman was born in the 1890s. His dad was a Scots whaleman um, who jumped ship and, 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 and settled in, uh, in Baja in the 1860s, married a local woman, really, really amazing person. We met another woman who was born in 1899, her dad was actually born in 1840. She was the last of 25 children. Amazing. I mean, this woman had remembered every hurricane that hit Baja in the 20th century. I mean, just incredible. But again, what this guy had remembered, uh, Don Olivas had remembered, was that what he was rowing his handmade skiff around Magdalena Bay, right, uh, with a homemade harpoon, harpooning sharks and turtles. He remembered seeing Norwegian whalers, the only Norwegian whalers that had worked the coast of Baja in the 1920s, filled the lagoon with blood, right? I mean, just amazing experiences. But again, what, they, what these people all told me was that they really got the fact that things had radically shifted, that everything had really changed. There had been significant changes in the abundance of marine resources in their lifetime, to the point where now their kids were seeking other alternatives. And it's, it's, an, it's not, it's coincidentally, his grandson became one of the first whale watching guides in Baja. So these people really were in a generation in which they, they witnessed the collapse of fisheries to a new way of doing things in response to the loss of resources, right? So really important. And more importantly, 
these got these guys all got that things needed to change. That we had they had they made lots of mistakes, right? In in, in managing resources. Um, and just to, and part of the book um, is Baja. There's a section of the U.S. Mexico border in Southern California. I'm just going to focus on, on mostly on Baja, but I think it's a, the nicest place. But um, we take Baja for granted in the sense that you know if you haven't been down there, you drive about five hours south, and there's this beautiful um, desert ecosystem. Even just um, south of Ensenada, the, what's the coastal state scrub and maritime scrub communities are among the world's best. There's nothing else like it on the, on, on the planet. Um, and just amazing. And right now, especially after it's rained, it's just incredible. Um, but on a global level, there's probably no other place on the planet where you have such a unique desert ecosystem, as much endemism, a unique cactus species that only, bl that only bloom when it rains, and which is very rare. Um, and then you've got this amazing untrammeled coastline. Um, and then further south on the Pacific, what you have are these ecosystems that really, up until recently, on a global level and then on a regional level, we've ignored in Mexico and then uh, all over the tropics. And these are mangroves. And this is Magdalena Bay, the area where that gentleman was, uh, had watched the whalers fill the bay with blood. This is one of the, this is the further south whale lagoon in, in, uh, in, in Baja. But the lagoon itself is 120 miles long. It's huge. It's five islands that protect the coast. This is just the middle one. This is actually the same island here. It's a huge bay. That island goes another 25 to 30 miles north, and then it's another 10 miles south. It's huge, huge. And it's like 20 miles in between here. It's like having like San Diego Bay at like five times, right? It's, it's huge. But um, these mangroves are critical areas where fish spawn, where you've got birds nesting. I mean, they're really, really critical ecosystems. And something that we've just realized that we have to save. And in this area in Baja, Wild Coast has actually systematically worked with survey teams to survey every inch of mangroves and every inch of coastline to get concessions to conserve all those mangroves with the Mexican National Park Service. And as part of the research of my book and the kind of the way that we work in Baja, we're really into uh, getting intelligence from on the ground, sort of almost like, uh, not like a CIA, but basically our job is to really go on the ground and find out what's happening. And this gentleman, Gordo Fisher or Fatso Fisher, uh, when I arrived at San Ignacio Lagoon in the 90s, doing my PhD work, I, I was look, looking at gray whales, but what I found out was that gray whales were fine, but sea turtles were almost virtually had disappeared. And everywhere I went in the field, I'd find carapaces of slaughtered sea turtles everywhere. This is when sea turtles, it was illegal to actually kill sea turtles. Well, it turns out the reason was because his fat so Fisher had a little yellow trailer on the shore of San Ignacio Lagoon. We estimate that he was killing a thousand turtles a year. He literally, personally helped decimate the population of eastern Pacific green sea turtles which, by the way, feed here in San Diego Bay, and actually in off La Jolla. The same turtles we have, if you guys haven't seen turtles off La Jolla, it's super cool. Those same turtles that are eating, feeding off algae and eelgrass, or surf grass, uh, here in La Jolla are probably coming from Baja, California, and this guy was killing most of their relatives. Um, and so that's part of the, a lot of the research that we're doing, and really trying to get on the ground and really talking to people about what's happening, versus having a scientist or some or newspaper reporter tell us what's happening. Um, in Baja, California, really, the gray whale is king, uh, I wrote a book about gray whales called Saving the Gray Whale, but uh, really you can't escape gray whales. And what's so remarkable about these whales is that, again, they're dependent on these mangrove systems that uh, you find in places like San Ignacio Lagoon, Scamos Lagoon, these giant flat uh, salt marsh uh, mangrove lagoons. And on, there's no other place on earth where you see these, they're called uh, desert mangrove systems in the sense that in most of the tropics you have rivers that flow in, sort of form estuarine systems, but these are completely... Uh, surrounded by dry desert. There's actually no fresh water flowing into these systems, maybe underground, but it's, it's, they're very interesting. So these whales really depend on this sort of fragile desert environment, and these areas have been uh, really uh, places for intense conflict over development. Um, right now, um, sort of the, the uh, ground zero for conservation in the Sea of Cortez in Baja, California, is a place called Cabo Pulmo National Park. It's the only coral reef in the Sea of Cortez, and it happens to be a marine protected area and one of the world's most successful. Um, and it's a very, if you haven't been out the East Cape in Baja California, it's the whole area east of San Jose del Cabo, uh, really between, um, between La Paz and San Jose del Cabo on the Sea of Cortez side. It's just absolutely gorgeous. I was there for eight days last week, um, and uh, you know it's amazing. And this coral reef is a very, very fragile area uh, around this town. There's only 60 people that live here, most of whom are foreigners or, then, or people who make their living from diving and ecotourism. Um, and what it also is, is I was out last week talking to my staff and we we're watching a pod of humpback whales. I mean, it's just amazing, right? And they're, they're really focusing on this coral reef. Uh, sea turtles, because the organization I, I, um, I run, Wild Coast, has really cracked down on turtle poaching. 
and the consumption of turtle meat and turtle eggs, turtles really are coming back to Baja. You see them a lot. It's a turtle feeding on off the coral and the coral reef. Um, and the most important thing about this, this, this marine protected area is that it was formed 15 years ago, but it took about six years for local people and, um, and biologists and government officials to get together and really stop fishing there. They all decided to ban commercial and sport fishing there. And, what, and the reason was is to really see if fish would come back to that area. Because when I was uh, in, in the 90s, I commissioned studies and I worked for the Nature Conservancy, and we were really worried about the reef dying. During the El Nino, all the, during El Nino conditions, the temperatures were increasing in, in the, in the uh, ocean temp water, and some people were really worried about coral bleaching, and the fish were doing really badly. Today, Cabo Pomo is considered a global success story for uh, marine conservation. The fish have come back in numbers. Um, there's a guy named Enrique Sala and Octavio Berto, who are Scripps P, uh, affiliated with Scripps, and they've done a lot of research here and really have done a great job monitoring this reef, and they've become big advocates for its conservation. Octavio. Some of these photos are his, um, because they realize how important this area is. Not only in itself, because it's become one of the most important fish spawning sites in the Sea of Cortez, but also it demonstrates on a global level that if you stop fishing in these keystone uh, fish spawning sites, the fish really will come back. Um, you see the rays. Whale sharks, there's only really about three places you see whale sharks in the Sea of Cortez, and they really depend on uh, the abundance of plankton, and then also they. A lot of whale sharks feed off fish spawn. You see a lot of whale sharks around areas where fish are spawning, especially uh, in the, uh, the Caribbean off Mexico and Belize, um, where they like snapper spawn. But these areas, are fe they're feeding on plankton, the Bay of La Paz, and then L.A. Bay, which is about four, uh, 400 miles south of here on the Sea of Cortez. Really remarkable animals. And you really only find them in these super uh, productive waters, areas that are really calm. And then obviously we have lots of plankton, and where they're not going to be disturbed. So the fact that you find whale sharks here that are being tagged, by the way, uh, is, is, is something remarkable. Um, and what's really important is that actually there was a study commission about the local people here who make their living from diving and ecotourism, they're big fans of this marine protected area, which is really cool, um, is that they actually their productivity rates in terms of how much money they're generating per capita is one of the highest in Mexico. It doesn't mean that they're super rich. It just means that they're doing really well from ecotourism, which is really cool. Um, and just, the, unfortunately, of course, the downside of that is that a, a Spanish corporation, Hans Urbana, has proposed building a city to rival or be bigger than Los Cabo San Lucas in this area. So we've been fighting that and we're very, very concerned about it. And that's something I really talk about in my book. It's really the whole idea of the Baja boom. Um, and what, um, what, what happened in Baja starting around 2000 is you had this really boom period of, of, of development all over the peninsula, especially between Tijuana and Sonata. And the idea was that they're going to replicate Cabo San Lucas all over Baja California and Northwest Mexico. Um, and I think the argument that the conservation I made is really is that there's probably only room for one Cabo. And there's nothing wrong with tourism development. It's great for people to make money. It's great for people to work in tourism. But probably isn't a smart idea or very strategic to build high-rise uh, condominiums and hotels everywhere in Baja, especially in areas where people actually don't live. Um, and so that's been, unfortunately, people didn't really listen to that. This is Loreto, Loreto Bay. Um, this is touted as one of Mexico's, quote, green developments. It's now in Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Um, in fact, people who bought condos there have been left high and dry without services, electricity, etc. Um, not only is the problem with development, but basically because these speculators move in and, and want to develop the coastline, they fence off the coastline. So in many areas of Baja California and Mexico, people actually can't physically access the coast. If you don't read Spanish, this is in the East Cape. You probably don't want to mess with guys who call their real estate offices Scorpion Real Estate. Who are from Culiacan, Sinaloa. Anybody who knows about the drug war knows that Sinaloa is one of the, the uh, centers of the drug cartel. So any guys who are calling their real estate enterprises uh, Scorpion Enterprises with an armed guard in a, in a, in a Stalag 13 style tower, you probably don't want to mess with. But the problem is, is that people who fished and, fought and ranched these areas for generations also can't access their own coast. And I'd rather have, as much as I don't like people saying hammer fish stock, I'd much rather have uh, traditional family fishing, obviously, than have, uh, you know, 25-story high-rises blocking access to the coast. Um, this is in uh, the East Cape where they're already trying to build a marina and uh, development at the end of the largest watershed in Baja. Um, unfortunately, what happens in a lot of these areas is that bad engineers tell bad developers what they want to hear, and what they want to hear is that they can build marinas and dredge asteroids at the, lar at the end of watersheds and when it rains, it looks like the Amazon River. So what's, gonna, what's a shame is this developer 
is dredging the coast. He's built marine, uh, trying to build breakwaters here. This will ne this is a huge sandy area. It will never fill in. It will never work. They'll never be able to dredge this. More importantly, he's made it illegal for local fishermen to actually use their own beach. Uh, people have been documenting this. Have been threatened with arrest. Have had their video cameras taken away. So it's really really unfortunate. Um, things got so bad in Baja that people put developer wanted signs on the highway. Um, and this is what we're left with between Tijuana and Ensenada is the fact that there are 24 empty high-rise buildings that just sit idle and empty and more than likely will never be used. Um, probably at some point they'll have been empty so long that they'll have to, to de demo them. Um, th these were really built in response to the whole second mortgage market in the United States. People getting second mortgages and using them to buy condos and stuff in Baja. Um, at one point, Donald Trump had proposed building a $700 million three-condo uh, project, three-building three project. Uh, I think he, he's being sued. Uh, the project went belly up. And not only that, not only did they have bad engineers and bad developers, they were bad engineers and bad developers, they were so bad that they actually put their project near a sewage river that puts 30 million gallons of sewage into the ocean every day. And so these guys didn't actually just go out on the ground and actually look at what they were doing. And we were met with them. Were you there, Ben? Was I was with you? When we were met with them. They were going to put a breakwater here because the surf gets really big here. And we're like, <laughs> we're telling him, your engineer doesn't know what he's talking about. No, 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 he's really good. And we're like, you know what? He doesn't know what he's talking about. You cannot build a breakwater here like a seawall and like try to build a, a sandy beach so people can play. When more, more than that, the, the water's polluted. Um, the other reality of Mexico is something we hear about. And this is the sort of yin and yang of Mexico because Mexico is a wonderful country filled with hospitable, friendly people. They're all over the place. It's 99.9% .9 of the population. We all know that, right? It's a great country. It's a beautiful country. Unfortunately, there's a very small percent of the population that has ruined everything for everybody else in small and certain areas like Tijuana or Acapulco or, or uh, in, in Ciudad Juarez. And with the reality of the drug war, though, this is just, we were, my staff was out trying to document the sewage river and they came upon these soldiers here. It's always a little nerve wracking to be around a bunch of armed soldiers. Uh, this is the, the dr drug saint. Jesus Malverde, this was a, uh, a shrine to him just outside of Ensenada on the, on the free road up to La Mission. Um, and I, I was with the New York Times reporter here, and um, well, people would, Jesus Malverde was like the Robin Hood of Sinaloa back in the 19th century, and he became a saint uh, for poor people, but essentially became a narco saint. And all the guys uh, taking drugs north would then write messages, you know, Dear Jesus Malverde, please let me deliver my mug across the border. So. Again, that's the reality of sort of yin and yang or bifurcated reality of Mexico. And right after this, this was actually written about in the New York Times by this guy, Joe Shark. He writes a travel column in the business section, I think every Tuesday. It's a great reporter. Had written about this, and it was demolished after that. Um, and then this is the, uh, that, that's a minor saint. This is a Santa Muerte, and this is a death saint in Mexico City. And we actually did a sea turtle campaign here, but uh, the death saint is really the patron saint, the real, real mega saint of the, the, the narcos, and you get masses with a thousand people down here in Mexico City, pretty, pretty heavy stuff. Um, but really, the issue that I, I talk about in the book, and I, I talk about all the time, is that, you know, I, I talk about conservation, I write about conservation, but I don't live conservation. But the people in Mexico that we work with, or on the U.S.-Mexico border, um, they're the ones who live conservation. They depend, whether or not they're, they believe themselves to be conservationists, at the end of the day, they depend on this fruitful and bountiful ocean and coast for their future and their livelihood. And so it's always impressive to me to see that people literally who have nothing, people who have live in shacks like these Indians, the Nahua Indians, and this is southern Mexico, uh, in Michoacan, where this, this community is racked by uh, violence from the, from the drug trade. There have been uh, murders in this area. I mean, but the women have decided that take it upon themselves to stop the trade, to stop people from plundering their beaches for the turtle eggs, right? And they sell in markets. And it's really remarkable. We did a documentary on Mexico's TV about them and been working with, uh, for, thanks to support from the Canadian government, to put up signs and really promote um, this area as an ecotourist destination. And again, they have nothing, but they give everything. And that's what's so remarkable about Mexico is that, again, people are so generous and so hospitable, and that's what infuses their fight to save their coastline, and this is in, in Punta Briojos, um, a fishing village about um, 600 miles south of the U.S.-Mexico border, just north of San Gabriel's Lagoon. These guys fought off the Mitsubishi Corporation from uh, building an industrial salt plant there. They've stopped uh, cruise ship terminals there. 
And that, that's because the entire town depends on harvesting lobster and abalone sustainably. And they've done so for 50 years. If you go to um, their, their lobsters, MSC or Marine Stewardship Council certified, it's the first community based uh, fishery in Latin America to get an eco certification, which their own government is against. Mexico doesn't like certification, having other countries certify its, its, its produce but, or uh, products. But it's a really good thing. And that's uh, Isidro Arce and Javier Vier Sanchez, just remarkable guys. And Ben and I were down there in September and uh, put on an ocean festival. And we had literally, I think, 60 kids or 40 kids, six, I think 60 kids, right, Ben? Mm -hmm. And another 40 people in the surf contest, all fishermen. Um, and at the end of the day, we, we had an award ceremony in front of the town when they were celebrating Independence Day. A thousand people came are watching this award ceremony. It's just remarkable, just great. And that's what really uh, inspires me. I was just going to talk a little bit about the border. but um, Anyway, I was going to talk about the uh, Tijuana Estuary. And in the book, I talk about a lot of our efforts to save the Tijuana Estuary. But, you know, what's, again, about what's important about the Tijuana Estuary is not only an estuary, but this reef offshore where I surf here surfing with my son is now a marine protected area. It's a leopard shark spawning site. It's a lobster area, lobster harvested. It's a really, really incredible place. Unfortunately, when it rains, you get these, these basically the Amazon River of sewage that can create a 40 square mile sewage bloom off the Pacific Ocean and basically fill this area with garbage. Uh, and basically, our team has started trying to figure out how to, to work on dealing with this plastic and the wave of tires. These two kids actually um, took pictures of this plastic, and they were our interns, and then basically carried out a little mini campaign to get authorities to take responsibility for dealing with really remarkable They're high school students at high tech high. Um, but the water's polluted. And just one of the things that we did, and we took this model we have from Mexico of really engaging local community to get some, to get some relief on this issue. Uh, we created a whole campaign, and at the end of the day, what um, I was at a talk today by a guy from UCSD and talking about why most ways that scientists communicate about issues don't work. That's because people re really respond to their, their values and get to keep things really simple. So we had all these scientists and, and engineers talk about the water quality problem of the border, and they're always throwing out MGD and 30 MGD and FPC, and, and even I have a PhD, and I, I don't know what the hell they're talking about at the time. So we came up with three words, clean water now. That's what we want. So we, instead of turning the water quality issue into a negative, we turned it into a positive. We had bumper stickers, we had billboards, we had bed sheets. Every kid in town had a t-shirt. They had stencils for their, their, their skateboards. And basically we created a movement to take back this issue of the Tijuana River and get some relief on it. Um, and we even had El Hijo de Santa. We, had, we worked really on a, a way to engage people culturally in Mexico and connect with their values. So our spokesman for, for water quality and then a lot of issues in Mexico is Mexico's most famous lucha libre or wrestler, who sort of his dad was a John Wayne of Mexico, El Santo. And so he's got this demigod status, and people love him. And so, again, um, the result of that was the fact that um, we got $100 million, over $100 million allocated for a new sewage plant. We've gotten some new sewage plants built on the border, and we really created a movement on both sides of the border to take back this issue, take back the Tijuana River, and really understand that it's not, an, it's not an environmental issue, it's a public health issue, and it's a quality of life issue. And our argument and the way we made this issue work, and I talk about in the book, is that we framed around kids. Every kid in TJ and every kid in South San Diego has the right to have access to healthy open space. And that's really, really the new way of talking about the environment. And this is something we just did on the border. You can't actually access this area anymore. It's been, uh, this giant border fence has been put there, but we had the executive team of REI and their board um, come and organize a cleanup with us and a restoration project. We had families from both sides of the border. We had over a thousand people there. It was amazing. Uh, and and uh, anyway, finally, to talk about something really quickly to end it, um, to talk about this idea of people power and just getting uh, getting people uh, active about the coast. But uh, Trussell's and San Onofre are probably the iconic surf spot. Uh, state Park in Southern California, at the north end of San Diego, um, the north end of San Diego County. And the Transportation Corridor Agency had proposed um, building a toll road, a private toll road, through the state park. And that turned into one of the largest campaigns ever in the history of California to save a coastal site. Uh, and it was really amazing. We worked with, this, with the Surfrider Foundation, who did this amazing job of connecting people viscerally and in a values-laden way with this place that they go. And we did all this kind of pop culture stuff. They were ingenious enough. Jim Moriarty, who's the CEO of Surfrider, used Ronald Reagan, who actually created Santa for State Beach as a, as a t-shirt my kids wear. Um, you know. And so 
Um, really amazing. We actually talked, we went up to, and I talked about in the book, to see Arnold Schwarzenegger and hand him a surfboard that a thousand surfers had signed, ask him to save the state park. He didn't uh, commit to the saving the state park, but he talked about surfing with Jerry Lopez in Hawaii when he was filming Conan the Barbarian. Um, and then <laughs> on February 8th, 2008, um, we had this massive um, Coastal Commission hearing to decide the fate of this, this proposal for a toll road. And uh, what was important for the kids that we brought up, and we framed the issue not only, it, the surf spot issue became almost irrelevant, really the way we framed it after what the campaign went on is that everybody in California, especially middle class and working class families, need to have access to this state beach. And you know, whereas kids from my community can't afford to go to Fiji, but they can't afford to go camp at San Mateo State Park. And that, that argument went over very well with legislators and in the Coastal Commission. Very, very important argument. Of course, the surfing stuff did too, but the fact that we're surfing. So we brought all these kids from Imperial Beach up to go to this hearing. They were, mar they were just amazing. They really, really, really believed passionately about saving this park. And um, the, the world's greatest big wave surfer, Greg Long, CJ Hobgood, one of the world's great surfers, Sean Thompson, sort of like the patriarch of professional surfers. And they really motivated these kids to, to, be, to be active. And at the end of the day, um, we won. 3,000 people came out to this meeting. We had another hearing with Noah. Uh, you know, the 3,000 people, uh, it was amazing. But when people are passionate enough to put, uh, you know, say, signs on their dogs, and then finally, uh, when you get kids out, uh, my, some of my kids, and then when people are, you know, uh, get their babies involved, what you realize is, is that at the end of the day, it really isn't about us. This fight for the coastline and this coastline isn't about us. It's about our kids and our grandkids and their kids' grandkids. And you don't get that concept so much here, but in Mexico, I'm sitting around, I'm always amazed by these people saying, people again, people have nothing, you know, there's nothing compared to what we have. And I'll say, you know, I want to make sure this is around for my kids, my, my grandchildren and their grandchildren, the grandchildren of my grandchildren. And that really always impresses me. I think that's something we have to be a lot more generous and less selfish about our coastline and make sure that we're able to share this wonderful resource with everyone. It's not just about those of us who live near the coast or those of us who surf. It's about making sure kids from Logan Heights or Compton or East LA or you know, El Cajon have access to this coast because at the end of the day, they're the ones we have to depend on to help us save it and to help us maintain it and help us become stewards of it because there's not enough of us on the coastline to do that. Mm -hmm. And that's what's, it's always impressive to see how people viscerally respond to their first contact with the ocean and understanding how beautiful the ocean is, and more importantly, how they have a responsibility and the, the, the opportunity to help take care of it. So anyway, that's my story, that's the book, it's Wild Sea. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the book, thanks for coming. If you guys have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Thank you. Okay. Have any, uh, yes? Yeah. First of all, I did read your book, and okay. it's fabulous. I oh good, I thank you. A lot of good information. Um, radiation from Japan. Oh yeah, right. Um, is it too soon to even ask a question about it? Have, have they set baselines from before? Are they setting them now? Even including San Onofre and you going... Right. I mean, it's, it's a huge, massive question, and is it just one big question mark at this point? Yeah, I'm not an expert on, on the nuclear disaster. I just, I'm, an, I'm, I'm an expert on evaluating the media coverage of nuclear disasters and how governments don't respond. <laughs> so yeah. I've been actually obsessed okay. with it. What I've been obsessed with is this idea of shifting baseline that was... Uh, if you read the media, and I'm obsessively following yeah. the media, it was less, not as bad as Three Mile Island, then it was worse than Three Mile Island, then it was wor worse than Three Mile Island, then it was not as bad as Chernobyl, and now of course it's worse than Chernobyl. Right. I think the, the real issue is that we have two nuclear power plants on our coastline, San Onofre and Diablo Canyon, that uh, are you know, earthquake prone areas. Um, I, I think really the issue is, um, at any level, what we always have to be concerned about when we have coastal development projects because uh, I'm not an expert on radiation, so I can't really answer the question what we yeah. have to be worried about in Japan. Right. What I do know, whether it's a liquefied natural gas facility or you know a mega project in Cabo Pomo, is that 99% of the time the people in, in charge of these projects don't know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, they make promises they can't, they don't really, uh, they can't keep. They say things that really aren't true, and more importantly, they're not interested in the ultimate goal, which is the manager of these these resources. They're interested in making a profit. And so whether it's Fukushima in Japan, in which this company basically did bad stuff so they could keep generating revenues and the, and the Japanese government overlooked it, or potentially put liquefied natural gas terminals on the coast, off, off the Coronado Islands, which we stopped, it's in my book. 
Um, we just have to put our foot down and say, what you're doing is not right. It's very hard to do that. It's very, very hard to do that. It's very, very hard for people to be advocates and go against uh, their governments and these, these corporations. But and time and time again, what I, what I show in the book is that people who have, literally have no power use their power and their passion to, 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 um, to make the case, and they win. So I guess the case of Japan is we've got to monitor that and make sure it doesn't happen here. Uh, and really make sure that we stop these projects. And there's nothing wrong with development, but make sure we do development in areas that are suitable for development and that we don't do development and, and then keep consistently destroying the last green and blue places we have in California, which is what I'm very concerned about. You know, and I think right now there's a good effort to, um, to restore a lot of areas, a big effort to re restore a lot of the watersheds and wetlands in Southern California, San Diego, the Otay River watershed, even the Tijuana River watershed, South San Diego Bay. Uh, San Diego River, and I think that's a, that's a wonderful thing. Rather than thinking about doom and gloom, we're really thinking about moving forward. So the response to Fukushima is let's hope it doesn't happen here. And then I think the, the, the more important thing is Japanese, the Japanese were obsessed with coastal barrier development. The idea of artificially putting up barriers along their entire coastline, and what we realized that doesn't work. Uh, and I was in Japan in the early 1990s helping um, some folks in Kyushu in the southern island um, save a giant wetland, and I was really impressed with the, these small groups of Japanese activists who were battling this tidal wave of, of uh, coastal dam uh, construction. And, yeah? I have a couple of questions. One, yeah. do you think the Trestles thing is actually dead for good? No, it's not. That, well, it, the, the TCA is still trying to uh, maneuver with the Pentagon and, and, um, and other agencies to get this going. I know NRDC and the Surfrider, Surfrider Foundation and Sierra Club were part of that coalition. I think we just wrote a letter recently right about it. Because um, it was a plan for the TCA's long range plan, had plans for this toll road still to go through San Onofre. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I. Um, so, you just have to maybe fight it again. It's yeah. awful. Yeah, you know, and it's realized that these battles are never won, which is why, you know, what. In, in Mexico, a lot of things that we're doing, like in San Ignacio Lagoon, in response to this proposal by the Mitsubishi Corporation to build this salt project, um, and I talk about it in the book, is that. We actually got a group of conservation NGOs together, and then we did conservation deals to make sure that development can never happen there. So we just did, did 140,000 acres where we uh, created a conservation easement with local residents. Mm -hmm. So they, they actually did a zoning plan. To, they, they themselves prohibited development, but they got payments for that. And they can still ranch and hunt and fish. They just can't allow, sell out to Mitsubishi. Yeah. And then number two, on the North Shore of San Ignacio Lagoon, we got the concession taken away from Mitsubishi and then all the land they were going to develop was put into conservation areas. And then on top of that, we have another, what's called a, basically another easement on top by, uh, held by an NGO. So th what we're doing is, and the lessons from trestles and all these other things is that you have to make sure the land is really protected. Yeah. And what we learn in our state parks is anybody can develop anything in state parks. There's no law against it. And we tried to get a law passed that would prohibit development in state parks. And right now we didn't pass it, right? We didn't pass it. Okay. So that's really the issue. It's like... We have a state park or a national park. You have to make sure that every inch of that land is actually land that is for conservation and doesn't somehow in, in a vacuum that allows development to happen. Yeah. So I think that's really the thing. Uh -huh. um, so, but yeah, the TCA is a horrible agency and they're still trying. But it'll never I, look. It'll never happen. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think you're right. Yeah. yeah. Um, what is the status of the bluefin tuna fishery tanks down uh, south oh, of yeah, Sonata? Right. I can't get a handle on it. I mean, I hear different stories. Yeah, I don't know a lot about that. Those are really, those are, um, if you guys haven't been down in Sonata, when you go down to a place called Saucy Poilus, you see these big tanks. They're, they catch wild tuna, put them in the tank, to feed them, and then sell them for sashimi. Um, I, I, I was actually in Baja, in Mag Bay, in Magdalena Bay, where they were first doing that, even before in Sonata. Yeah. And I went to actually help feed the fish. Yeah. Um, those projects would be good if they were, let's say you had a thousand fishermen. And they were fishing with gill nets and destroying everything. But you said, okay, we're going to take those thousand fishermen, and they're only going to work in this bluefin tuna fishery. So they're going to save. They're going to. They're not going to fish over a hundred square miles of fishery. That would might be a good thing because you're, you're reducing environment their, their impacts over an ocean area. Problem is, it's not started the case with these projects. I, I'm. I think it's pretty controversial. A lot of environmentalists are really divided on that. I, I think they have they can have a, a, a pretty big impact on that on the site level. Mm -hmm. And then the fact is you're still taking wild tuna out of the ocean, right? Mm -hmm. So you're not you're not really mitigating a fisheries 
impact. Does that make sense? But is there, are they having a problem pulling yeah. in the wild tuna? I mean, we hear that they're getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Yeah, so it's a problem. Yeah, but there's a, definitely wild tuna all over the world are declining in yeah, size. Yeah, there's yeah. problems with mercury poisoning and yeah. mercury levels in tuna. So my argument would be that it's not. At first, I thought this could be a good thing because we saw fishermen working on that. But if there's only a few fishermen managing these pens, oh, yeah. it doesn't mean that the rest of the guys aren't hammering with gill nuts or long lines right around them. So I think that's, that's something that uh, needs to be looked at more. Yeah. It's pretty much an unregulated fishery in Mexico. Yeah. So, anyway. Yes? Do you still drive to Baja with your kids? I'm just curious. Yeah, I do. Okay. Yeah, um, for those about the whole issue of safety, uh, Northern Baja, you just have to really worry about Tijuana, like don't drive to Tijuana at night. But I, I just do, I did 3,000 miles round trip with my kids, uh, and my wife was down in the East Cape last summer. We drove in the most remote parts of Baja. We, uh, we work in the most remote part of Baja. We've had any problems lately. The government's really made an effort to keep things safe. I just came back from eight days uh, in southern Baja. There are absolutely no problems. So Baja California Sur is the safest part. Baja California Sur and Oaxaca are, are considered uh, the safest areas in Mexico. Uh, so things are really, really safe. We were in Guerrero uh, a couple weeks ago, where Acapulco is. Acapulco is pretty gnarly, but um, 35 people were murdered in the three days that we were there. Uh, it's pretty heavy. Zihuatanejo, though, is very very safe. Uh, Ixtapa is very safe. So, And we were in a small surf village, Saladita. Was, people really weren't worried about locking things up. You know, it was very, very interesting. But then a guy was robbed at a surf spot in North Africa. So, anyway. But Baja's <laughs> fine. Yeah. Yeah. What is, I mean, reading your book, you have got so much going. Well, there's a right. lot going. What would you consider your most pressing um, project right now that's demanding your most immediate attention? Uh, and what can we do to help as well, individuals? You, well, first of all, all of you can join Wild Coast and support her efforts. Yeah. That's I mean, great. Well, yeah. Volunteer <laughs> for environmental <laughs> issue, uh, or cleanups and stuff. I really think of every issue that's along the Pacific, the, the, the uh, pollution of the Tijuana River and the issue of plastic and tires mm -hmm. that are flowing in the ocean, by far there's nothing else like it. It is, yeah. you know, it, it, sh it should be an overwhelming problem. It isn't. I know we can deal with the problem. Ben here has done a great job of getting a handle on that. We're working right now. We've got a grant from the EPA to work in canyons to teach people how to deal with their trash. Uh, we'd love to have more recycling and, and plastic in Mexico, but that is the most pressing issue for me. I mean, it's just, you know, it's, just, it's horrible. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, but there is a lot we can do. There's a lot we have done. There's a lot more we can do. And the most important part of that component, again, has been getting kids and families to understand that there's a lot they can do. You know, that picking up one piece of trash with their friends and family, it makes a difference. You know, getting together with 1,000 people or 300 people on a cleanup day, which we do, is, is a huge deal. And even though when it rains, the trash comes out again, it's not to give up. Not to give up. Is there a recycling program or... In Mexico? Yeah. That, I mean, if they pick up all the plastic, what? Oh, yeah. what if they got paid for no. it, they, they would do it. <laughs> There's very few recycling centers in Mexico. It's a big deal. Uh, if, there, if there would be some recycling, you wouldn't see any plastic anymore. Yeah. You know, but the fact is, yeah, 10 to 15 true. years ago in Mexico, nobody had, you know, we were, we were down in Guerrero, and I felt bad because we couldn't find, well, I got my water bottle taken away by the uh, airport security, but we couldn't even find big gallon, uh, you know, big, those five gallon jugs to fill our water bottles up. We had to keep buying plastic water bottles. We felt guilty once it generated a whole giant bag of, of trash mm -hmm. just on, for one trip. So that's a big problem. Yes? Um, a couple of years ago, well, I'm, I'm a middle school, I was a middle school science teacher, okay. and my kids did a lot of volunteer work down in Tijuana Estuary, and I kind of became obsessed with IB, and I love Wild Coast. Okay. And um, I was thinking about moving down there, okay. but then just reading so much about everything, and so many times when I'm down there, you know, the signs are up. Yeah, and, right. Um, so we didn't move down there, but I'm, it's kind of still in the back of my mind, and I'm just wondering, what do you think the future is? Because I know so much of the sewage comes from, you know, places where there isn't sewage treatment, and you know, even the the, I, the, the, the plant that went up. I mean, is it? Yeah, high? it really depends on rain. We're getting a handle on the dry weather events. I think a lot more. Uh, it, a lot of it, you know, a lot of the stuff that comes down to it is the mismanagement of a system by a th agency. So, for example, we had a lot of days that beaches were closed this year, and it turns out. What happened when a rock had fallen in a, like, buried Barrett Dam or something? It was, something had happened with a diverted structure, and so they were dumping water into the Tijuana River from Barrett Dam. And that was causing the river to overflow and beaches to be closed. I mean, and, you know, so there's a lot of things like that we can, we can do better. Uh, if you guys might have heard in the news, but we discovered uh, a sewage pipe that was spewing a million gallons a day into the beach of Plaza Tijuana in January, and had been broken for three weeks. So we discovered that, you know, and so no one has said anything about it. And then the minute we discovered it was on the front page of the Santa Union that morning, 
the authorities in Tijuana started fixing it. <laughs> so anyway, you know, um, you know, I live in Imperial Beach. I have a you know Wild Coast office across the street. Uh, I really don't like driving up to La Jolla to surf, um, and so <laughs> so I, I think things okay. will get better. It's just going to take a lot more time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you ever have any overlap with the, I think the Nature Conservancy or buys actually buys the land so that you were saying about taking sure that it can't be. Do we, will we yeah, do that? We so so while those buys are, are you part of? I mean, I, I no, we work. No, we work very close with them. But like, we, like I started Wild Coast essentially to be like the Nature Conservancy okay, meets what, Greenpeace. Okay. So we actually own thirty, close to thirty miles of coastline in Baja okay. California. So, and so uh, that seems to work. The, the yeah. issue with large organizations like Nature Conservancy, NRDC, and World Wildlife Fund, they're so big um, that they're focused on a, almost a global and national right. level. Right. So we partner with we partner with NRDC all the time. You know, we talk to the Nature Conservancy, World Wildlife Fund, et cetera, because they need us to be to work more on a regional level. Right. So yeah, and the Nature Conservancy is a great organization. Yeah, I was like, I wouldn't have started Wild Coast, uh, and I'm lucky I work with them to understand how, you know, you run a conservation organization. Good. Uh, good. Well, I don't have any more questions. Um, you're welcome to buy a book. I get more information. Everybody who buys a book. It's a copy of a DVD called the Baja Wave Document that you guys will really enjoy. It's sort of a, a 30 minute documentary behind the scenes of our efforts to stop. A major development project, and with our fishermen and many of them who were in this in this slide. So anyway, so thank you very much. Thanks.